You are listening to A Scary State, and this week we're covering Indiana. So, Kenzie. Yes, Lauren. Let's get scary. Guess what? What? Chicken butt. No. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Indiana was the first state that I ever did. Really? Mm-hmm. Aw. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah, this is like my first, well, not my first, like, double. Mm-hmm. But I only got to do, like, a handful of them the first time, so I didn't have a lot of doubles. Aww. So, yeah, this is my first one. That's really exciting. Yeah. Why well, not, right? Look at that. We're finally full circle. <laughs> we really have. Especially because we're almost done with the states again. Mm-hmm. We only have, yeah, like, one more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You want to hear a funny story? I do. So, on Saturday, I was watching my friend's dog, Murph. <laughs> Love him. And Murph was, like, sniffing something over by the sliding door. Okay. And I was like, what's he doing? And then I just seen, like, little... His ears? No. Oh. Like, in, you know, like, when you have a sliding door, you have, like, the silver part that's mm-hmm. where the door fits. Right. You could see little, like, you know... Antennas? Whatever. People can't see what you're doing. <laughs> Skinny, wiry, bug-looking things. Legs, antennas, I don't know, but... Oh. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. And so Murphy kept sniffing it, and I thought he was going to eat it. <laughs> and I was like, honestly, I don't, I don't fucking care. <laughs> <laughs> Just do it. Just do it. And I thought I heard a crunch, <gasps> and I screamed, and that scared Murphy. So <laughs> he ran away and did not eat the bug. And I kept trying to get Murphy to go back to eat the bug, and <laughs> he wouldn't. He decided he didn't want to eat the bug, which I don't blame him. He probably had PTSD from getting screamed at probably when he looked at the bug. I was I tried to calm myself down. It wasn't working, and he just went and hid in my room until I was done. Oh. And so I got my raid off bug spray mm. and mm-hmm. a Lysol. I just pick up chemicals that I can find and spray the shit out of a bug. And hope to Some God chemicals dies. like can't be mixed. I fumes might have gone to my head a little bit, but I like if you mix what is it bleach and vinegar, you make like chlorine gas, well, which is dead. I was not going to do that. I was just <laughs> going to take my spray of Lysol and bug spray, <laughs> okay, and spray the shit out of this bug. And so I did, which of course, like it freaked out and didn't <laughs> die right away because it's a fucking roach. <laughs> no. j- okay, you remember no. the episode of Fairly Odd Parents where like the roaches like take over? Oh yeah, that was this fucking roach. <laughs> like that, that was it. They will survive like a nuclear fallout, right? Which is why I'm like, I'm gonna dump this whole canister on you <laughs> because I- at the very least, I can slow you down. <laughs> <laughs> So it goes behind the couch, and I'm pacing now. And I'm like, oh, my God. I don't know where it is. I'm not going to move the couch. No. And I was like, okay, well, they're going to come pick up Murphy soon, so I bet I could have them come inside and, like, get the bug. Mm-hmm. But then the bug came out from the couch. I swear to God, it looked like it was about to come straight for me. I was screaming and spraying all at the same time, and then it, like, turns and tries to go to the door. I'm like, yeah, I want you to get the fuck out of here, too. Spraying the crap out of it, it like kind of flips over and is like, <laughs> and I just keep spraying until it like pretty much stops moving. Why didn't you squish it? Because it's a roach. Yeah, but if it's upside down at it's that huge, bug guts everywhere. <laughs> I can't. No, 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 no. That's why I think they're gross because I, I can't. <laughs> Anyway, so finally when I felt it was incapacitated enough, I got out the vacuum and I sucked it up. But then I had another problem. Because in the little, like, dust canister thing, it was smack up against the window. No. And I was like, if this was, like, mixed together in the other dirt. I couldn't see it. We'd be fine. I'd be okay. And I was like, you know what? I need a new vacuum anyway. So I threw the vacuum away. Mackenzie. I need a new vacuum. Mackenzie. I was not going to ask my friends to come in and empty the dust canister for me in the dumpster across the parking lot so that this bug would be out of there. I had to face it away from, like, being able to view until I was, was able to go. Was it still alive? No, thank God. Oh, At least good. I didn't hear anything. That's a little arm twitch. <laughs> I didn't hear or see anything. And then I... Decided, you know what? I've been wanting a new vacuum, and this one is on its last leg anyway, and so I threw it away. (laughs) (laughs) I have no shame whatsoever. 
kind of like vacuums mom had this one big like curtain hanger Mm -hmm. and it had like the ends were like a hole pretty much and so whenever there would be stink bugs in the house Mm -hmm. she would like catch it with this thing and then she would just keep covering it with a paper towel (laughs) and I was like Donna get rid of it she goes I don't want to touch them I don't want them to die because then they smell and I was like woman so she just had stink bugs stacked in a rod I mean it was big broad it wasn't like they were one on top of the other but she threw it away eventually but it was just so funny. I was like, you need to stop doing that. Well, anyway, I have a new vacuum now. It's really oh, my cool. God. Um, it, like, charges. And so oh it's cordless. And it comes with all these different kinds of, like, doodads. And so I am you know, can get underneath things a lot easier. Oh, and I'm going to finally very be able to clean exciting. up my car. <sighs> very And exciting. on the little, like, circle thingy, it tells you how much battery life is left. Oh. But all the reviews, it says it was... Five stars. We need a new one because our vacuum now smells like dog because of all the dog fur that we vacuum up on a very regular occasion. Yeah. See, that was also my problem is every time I vacuumed, it, it would smell. It didn't smell better. It smelled worse. Yes. Like I'd have to light five candles. Yeah. Mom was like, you know, you have to clean out like that little filter. And I said, yes, I know. So and I've cleaned it and it doesn't help. This vacuum, the little thing that like the hair usually gets stuck around, you can take that off <laughs> and get the hair out. Genius. And put it back. Genius. I know. Wow. Yeah. So, look, I live by myself, okay? And I can only do so much. And I can't just, like, call people and be like, come back and, and kill this bug. I mean, yeah, okay, valid. Right. Yeah. And so I'm I'm going to have to do what I'm going to have to do. Mm-hmm. And that'll be that. And so I threw away a vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> Because the bug was in it. It was so big. It was like the size of my pinky. Ew. I'm not kidding. I believe it. Like, I know I can be dramatic about these things, but this thing was fucking huge. <laughs> like, it was truly about to get all of its little roach buddies and take over my fucking apartment. It's going to go get its mice friends, too. Mm. Mice and the roaches. I was hoping that with, like, you know, dogs hanging out in my apartment all the time. that this... I don't think it works with dogs. I think the scent thing is like cats. Because remember I told you at the mouse thing, you need a cat. I don't want you to have a cat either. <laughs> I don't like cats. Yeah. I like. I wouldn't be able to come over to your house. I like two cats. I like Sally, my sister's cat. And that's not even all her cats. <laughs> and I like Arlo, Allie's cat. And that's not all her cats either. I had two cats that I liked and that was it. Because oh, my I body. I those kitties. Yeah, there was Simba and then there was Babu. <laughs> Who ran away? I know. I was devastated. I know. Everyone else was very happy. I wasn't happy. I loved him. I know. He would cuddle with me at night. He was nice to me. Yeah, he was nice to me and everyone else. Well, me and my friends. He <laughs> did not like the family. And if they would come pet him, he'd like, like claw at them. I'm like, he's awful. I said, no, he's so cuddly. Oh, I ha- I remember this one time. I was in college. One of my roommates had a cat. This is before I knew how deathly allergic to cats I was. Which is weird because you had cats. I know. I think, like, my body built up a little bit of an immunity yeah. because I, I was good with those cats. Right. But so my roommate had a cat. She left for the weekend, so it was just me and the cat. And I was like, oh, no problem. Like, I got it. I think the cat was, like – and I think this is the cat I slept with it a couple times, like, oh. in the room. Like, it was fine. Like, we were good. But then at some point, it turned into, like, a demon. And I remember walking out of my bedroom one day, and it, like, jumped off of our washing machine at me. And I was like, huh. So I, like, ran into the kitchen, got what I needed, ran back to my room and slammed the door. And that's where I stayed all weekend. And I told her, I was like, I don't like your cat. (laughs) All right, so do you want to dive into Indiana? Sure thing, chicken wing. You're all about chickens, huh? I got more. The Paleo Indians were already living in Indiana by 8,000 BCE. Wow. Mm-hmm. Indiana receives 10, 000, tens of thousands of Christmas letters addressed to Santa every year. Ah, because of Santa Claus, Indiana. Was that cute? Mm-hmm. I love that. The world's largest ball of paint is in Alexandria and contains thousands of coats of paint. It's like this big, like as wide as my arms can go. It's huge. Mm-hmm. And, and so they just add a coat of paint. It bothers me that like people are allowed to name towns in other states the same thing. There's a lot of Alexandrias. I know, and it bothers me. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm just saying. You know, you feel like you're original, and then you hear it in 10 other places. Oh, yeah, like, no. Wow. Okay, Not cool. original at all. Although I think our Alexandria was first because we have an old town. 
Yeah, exactly. And we were one of the founding 13 colonies, so. Oh, yeah, duh, obviously. Yeah. Lewis and Clark started their adventure from Fort Bencinas. Bencinas. Sure. Okay. (laughs) Indiana is one of the largest producers of popcorn. Ah! And we're eating popcorn. we're eating popcorn. Orville Redenbacher popcorn specifically. Indiana was a big place on the Underground Railroad. Catherine and Levi Coffin sheltered and fed over 2,000 runaway slaves over a period of 20 years. Their home was known as the Grand Central Station of the Underground Railroad. I just thought that was cool to add. In 2013, Indiana was known as the meth capital of the U.S. Oh, wow, it overtook Ohio. How Mm. nice. Mm. With over 1,800 meth busts that year. I read this really funny article today. This one lady. Okay, so apparently there are some names that will be rejected when you name your baby that name. And so, what? Yes, I was reading all these things like Massachusetts. The first, middle, and last name can be no more than 40 characters total. Um, Other places, the first and middle name can't be more than 30 characters. Like, it's weird. But so this one couple in Australia was like, we're going to find a name that they reject. Like, we're going to name our child a name that they're going to reject. The name they chose was Methamphetamine Rules. And then their last name because they're like, this is going to get rejected. They sent it through. It got accepted. So their child's legal name was methamphetamine rules. And so they changed it. But they were like, we thought it was going to get rejected. And like, this is really bad that it fell through the cracks. And Australia was like, oh, no. So they started like making their practice better of what names they would accept and what they wouldn't. But now the baby's legit official name, even when it changes its name, is always going to be methamphetamine rules. You just call it Anne for short. <laughs> But, like, on all your legal paperwork, like, oh, what's your, like, birth legal name? Methamphetamine rules. Well, rules would be the middle name, so you just have to do methamphetamine. Yeah, methamphetamine. <laughs> hi, I'm methamphetamine. <laughs> oh, my God. But, yeah, the parents were like, yeah, we made a big mistake. Here's my thing. It already bothers me when the DMV can deny a license plate because <laughs> it's not appropriate. Did you have a license plate that they denied? No, but I've, like, heard of other ones that are, like, really fucking funny. And the, you know, DMV government people are like, no, that's inappropriate or offensive. And it's not. It's like a fart or (laughs) something like that. Like, someone had a license plate of fart and (laughs) that was not okay. And I was like, the fuck? Yeah. I'm like, that's funny. (laughs) That is funny. And if we are going to continue to bow down to these people that are unjustly pissed off about stupid reasons... Then, yeah, we are going to just cancel everything. Mm -hmm. We need to cancel the people that are like that. Yeah. That's what I say. Yeah. But then now on top of it, you're trying to tell people what they can and can't name when they're, I'm like, I have seen some just outrageous, ridiculous fucking names. Half the ones you said in our Arkansas episode alone should have been canceled. And I'm like, okay, you can't tell someone what they can name their kid. No, yeah, there are rules. Mm, That's ridiculous. Yeah, things can get denied. There, I'm like, okay, how can we have a rule for that? That's regulated. But then there's all these other things that we could probably use some, like, government detention to kind of get in order a little bit and, you know, smooth out nothing. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I have to say about that is yeah. Anyway, I thought Johnny Appleseed was not a real person. Oh, you go into that. Yeah. Johnny Appleseed is buried in Johnny Appleseed Park, formerly Archer Cemetery, and the man who inspired the American <laughs> folk tale <laughs> is actually John Chapman, and he died in Fort Wayne in 1845, and he's the one who is actually buried. Uh-huh. That's, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, who's the other guy? Who had the... Paul Bunyan? Yes. He, he's also, like, folk tale, right? With his blue ox. And a uh, copper or something? What? David Copperfield, is he a real person? Yeah, he's a real person. person. Okay. <laughs> Donnie Appleseed, David Copperfield, Paul Bunyan, they just don't sound like real names. Um, Paul Bunyan was an amalgamation of two Canadian lumberjacks, Fabian Fournier and Bonjean. So he's not a real person. Okay. But David Copperfield is definitely. What was he, a magician? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know who Danny was real. Yeah, he was. <laughs> <laughs> their name should have been regulated 
On March 25th, 1995, the deadliest tornado in U.S. history hit Indiana, as well as Illinois and Missouri. Illinois. Illinois Why and Missouri. Why do you Missouri. call it Mil- Illinois? Why do they have an S on the end? Why does my last name have an I-E-R? Good fucking question. I know. Mine has a fucking silent K. There's no way to know language. It's you stupid. should know. It was a category F tornado. and F5. F5. What did I say? F. Just F. <laughs> <laughs> it was a category F5 tornado and became known as the Tri-State Tornado because it hit three, three states. states. And it traveled 300 miles. That's a lot. No, I know. but like No, I know. Three, but Yeah, three yeah. and tri. And, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So but I don't think we, we absorbed... The true magnitude of 300 miles. We don't, I, don't, I, I don't know where we are. We don't have our map. And I know. We don't have our map. I'm lost. I, I don't understand. Don't know where anything is anymore. No. 693 people lost their lives while 2,000 other people were injured. Yeah. The first train robbery in history. In U.S. history or history altogether? I don't know. I think the article said in history. So I think it might be in history. Wow. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, trains weren't around forever. But I thought that, like, places like China and places in Europe already had. No, that wouldn't make sense. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. They had railroads. Right. Didn't they already have trains for us? I don't know. Maybe. I can't remember when that whole thing was invented. I guess electricity had to come first. (laughs) (laughs) Interesting. I want to look into that. I want to know. Because, like, if railroads started here. The first train was invented in 1804. Where? The Welsh mining town of Merthyr Tydfil. Interesting. Yeah. But the first robbery, I guess, took place. Wow, that's pretty good. 60 years later? I don't think you read the full sentence, so I don't think people know. No, I know, but I'm talking to you. (laughs) (laughs) So the first train robbery in history took place in Jackson County on October 6, 1866. So yeah, 60 years later. <laughs> 60 years later. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. It took actually. that long. Yeah. For people to be bad. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. The Reno brothers made off with $13,000, which I'm sure is so much money now. Oh, wow. Time money converter. Oh, it's not, actually, I don't think time money converter goes back that far. <laughs> Oh, yeah. No, it only goes back to 1913. Mm. I don't think I can do 1866. It's not as much money as I thought it was going to be. I'm not going to lie. How much is it? Um, so $13,000 in 1866 is equivalent to purchasing power to about $251,027.55 today. Oh. I mean, it's still a good amount of money. Oh, for sure. Yeah. But I don't know. I just thought that that would be much higher for some reason. Yeah. Oh, my God. The little, like, inflation line how like barely it starts to move and then all of a sudden like the 80s it just goes yeah not surprising you know who was uh president in the 80s oh you no (laughs) um what's the guy the actor's name oh my god why am i blanking on his name kennedy no reagan reagan oh he was the one who came down came up with uh trickled on economics and Mm. we've seen how well that those work Mm mm-hmm Crawfordsville is home to the only known working rotary jail in the U.S. A rotary jail is a jail where the cells are sort of wedges on a platform. The platform rotates in a carousel fashion, making only one cell accessible at a time. It was built in 1882 and operated until 1972. It still works now, but it is used as a museum. Yeah, so like picture like a block of cheese. Okay. <clears throat> or a pizza, a pizza. Mm-hmm. Picture pizza. Each slice mm-hmm. is a jail cell. Okay. So that's the only cell that can be opened at a time. So it rotates and all the cells. So like when you need to talk to like prisoner B, Mm -hmm. you'd rotate it until prisoner B is there. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I'd feel about that. No, I don't like it. If I had to go to jail, I wouldn't want to go to that one. No, (laughs) because like. I don't like feeling like I can't get out. I mean, I know I can't get out. No, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, no, I understand. I think the same thing too. I have this thing about not being able to get out. Like being trapped in things. Mm, doesn't have to be like in something. Usually it's just like a crowd. Oh, okay. Or like I get really nervous if there's only one way in and one way out and there's well, a lot of people. Makes sense. That makes me nervous. Okay. Yeah. That's a valid fear. Yeah. I'd yeah. say. 
I don't think yours is an invalid fear. Thank you. I, completely valid. My coworkers were trying. It's for, just not why you were afraid. That's my all. coworkers were trying for 20 minutes yesterday to convince me to go on an elevator. Why? Because they really want me to. Why? I don't know. That's because they know silly. how much I hate it. That's silly. One of my coworkers was like, I will give you two of my paychecks if the elevator stops. And I said, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> no. Mm -mm. My fear is not your entertainment. Mm -hmm. So I took the stairs. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. I... And then we got lost. <laughs> <laughs> I've just gotten good now at not looking at the numbers. Oh, yeah. See, it's not. I, I like looking at the numbers. I like knowing that I'm moving. Fair. I I like to feel that I'm moving. And hear, I don't mind hearing the beeps. But I just can't. I just can't know how high up I am. Or <laughs> I, just, I already was starting to get dizzy as I, like, when I get to the third, oh my God. the last set of stairs, my hands start sweating. <laughs> yeah, Mackenzie has to walk up my stairs and she comes into the door and she goes, feel my hand, it's sweaty. <laughs> I was nervous. I don't, I don't like hats. <laughs> so there is a gravesite right in the middle of a road in Amity. Never mind. Nope. Keep that locked in my brain. In 1831, this plot was on a hill that overlooked Sugar Creek. Plans to build a road were proposed, which would mean that these graves would be moved to other sites around town. Nancy Curlin Barnett was buried here, but her grandson didn't want her moved. So he guarded her grave with a shotgun while the other buried here were moved. Eventually, county officials agreed to just leave it where it was and building the road around the plot where Nancy was buried. There is now a concrete slab protecting the grave and a historical marker marking the location as well. It's like people literally drive around the grave. There's a um, Dr. Seuss book. Like one of them is, is about these like two... I don't know, brothers, family members, whatever they are. And they're, one goes north and one goes south. And they just keep going in that direction. But then eventually, mm -hmm. and they won't move. They won't step to the side. So they just stand there. And all these bridges and stuff get built over them in the process as these two little things stand there. And that's what I pictured when I read this story. <laughs> <laughs> 41 towns across Indiana can be considered ghost towns. Mm -hmm. Jim Jones founded his congregation, the People's Temple in Indianapolis. Ding, ding, ding. And then he moved to Guyana. Yes. But I just meant like a, a cult. Yeah. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Easter egg. Rearview mirrors and sliced bacon come from Indiana. So random. I know. You forget that there are like things that have to be invented. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you do. Like rearview mirrors. Mm -hmm. The Raggedy Ann doll was invented in 1914 by Marcella Gruella DeVille no. <laughs> <laughs> um, of Indianapolis. Six vice presidents have come from Indiana, giving it unofficial nickname of the mother of vice presidents. Garfield the cat is from Fairmount. Michael Jackson and Janet Jackson were born in Gary and Colonial Sanders. Colonel. Colonel Sanders. <laughs> There's no fucking R in there. Yeah, but it's Colonel. The founder of KFC. I know, but it's one of those words that just bothers me. Yeah. Anyway, the founder of KSC, he was born in Henryville, and Jenna Fisher was born in Fort Wayne. Who's that? Jenna Fisher played Pam on um, The Office. Ah, yeah. There you go. I mean, she was in a lot of other things, but that's like her big role. So yeah, that's Indiana. What's the scene, Jelly Bean? Okay. I don't like Jelly Beans, though. What? Have I? Okay. There used to be the Harry Potter Every flavor jelly beans. Mm -hmm. And I used to eat them and they have scarred me from jelly beans that now I can't eat jelly beans because it brings me like this flashback of those Harry Potter jelly beans. Cause they would have like one that looked no, like spaghetti. No, I remember. Remember when we went to. Yeah. That was crazy. I can't believe we both have that same memory. We went to a hotel for this girl's birthday and a lot of stuff went on, but we ate jelly beans. We're just little shits. But anywho. So my coworker recently, she loves to do these like things where she's like, it just brings everyone together. So she got these really bad gummy beans or jelly beans, gummy beans, jelly beans. And it was called a game called Bean Boozled. And you spin a spinner mm -mm. and it shows you what the jelly bean looks like that you have to take. It will either be a good flavor or a bad flavor. Mm -hmm. So you might get like mint or I don't even remember what the flavors were, but like bubble gum or toothpaste. Ooh. So I couldn't play. People were like, Lauren, please play. I said, I literally can't. But we would watch people play and it was so funny because they would take the first bite and nothing. Then they would take the second bite and then either their face would be really happy or it would just drop. It was so fun. 
I'm sure for the for the viewer. <laughs> I was able to do the jelly bean one with spicy things, though, because there was also spicy jelly beans. I spun it and I got jalapeno and I was able to eat it, but it was like really gross and a little spicy and it just left this weird like taste and tingle on my tongue. So, okay. Yeah. I only like the orange jelly beans. Okay. So the one that I have might not be too long. Oh, but I'm so excited. For but it. it is too bizarre to not tell. I'm so excited for this. Oh, I am I'm too. so glad that you're doing it. All right. So overall trigger warning, mentions of suicide. Okay. Nashville, Indiana is quite the opposite from its name counterpart in Tennessee. At a 2010 census, Nashville, Indiana only had a population of 803. Damn. Yes. Our high school had more people. I saw <laughs> when I was driving here, mm -hmm. um, the person that I got behind had a Briarwood sticker. Wild. And I say, Bleh! and then pass them. <laughs> <laughs> you should have looked in to see if you knew them. No. You could have. Not like way. Not driving as fast as I was down the highway, I couldn't. Okay, valid. <laughs> That census also said that Nashville had a total area of only 1.01 square miles of land. That's small. Yeah, a very small town. So this was one of those places where everyone knew everyone. I Yeah, you're squished and there's only, you only got one square mile between you. Right. <laughs> People knew everyone pretty well, like very close down. So on November 18th, 1970, at 6.20 p.m., a fire broke out in a barn in the town. The small group of volunteer firemen struggled to get the fire under control, but when they finally did, they discovered possible signs of arson, and tragically, among the ashes, they found a body. The body had no arms or legs, which were believed Ooh. to have been burned off due to the intense heat from the fire. Damn. And laid across the man's chest was a shotgun. Investigators initially referred to this body as, quote, a mystery man, 60 to 65 years old, balding white hair, and about 5'8 in height. The man was later identified to be Clarence Roberts. The Roberts family lived a very lavish lifestyle. Clarence and Geneva got married in 1941. The two had four sons, Bernard, Forrest, and Lauren, L-O-R-E-N, and I was never able to find the name of the fourth son. <laughs> I know, one, two, three. <laughs> yep. So these are the three, and then there's a fourth somewhere. Geneva grew up very poor, but together, she and Clarence were able to make a life worth living. They soon purchased three luxury cars and an expensive and fashionable house. Ooh. Clarence had served in the Army and fought in World War II. When he returned home, he got straight to work, working hard and building this new life. Clarence was one of only three men in the entire country to attain the highest honor at the Masonic Lodge, 33 degree status. Oh. This is a master mason who has exhibited knowledge, passion, and sacrifice to his craft. Mm. It is a way to honor those who have performed outstanding and selfless work. So it's a big deal. Sure. Yeah, sure. He served as director of the Nashville State Bank. In 1950, he ran for and won the county sheriff position. So really, he was well-respected within the community. He held high status among others, very well-liked. As they always say, a pillar of the community. Mm -hmm. After finishing his term as sheriff, Clarence and his brother Carson— what? After finishing his term as sheriff— That's not what I— <laughs> What did you hear? All I heard was when he was finishing to return to sheriff, <laughs> and I was like, mm-mm. <laughs> <laughs> when finishing his term as sheriff— Thank you. Clarence and his brother Carson— Opened up a hardware store together. I'm starting to think that you picked these based on names alone. I was thinking, too. I was like, this one has C's. Our last one had C's. I have a whole idea in my head of a compilation of all the times I'm like, that's an interesting name. Wow, that name. Oh, my God, that name. You can get like 15 from last episode. <laughs> <laughs> that's not all where I got it from. So the two brothers, they opened the Roberts Brothers Lumber Company of Nashville. Okay. Yes. Everything was going great for a while. The two brothers had a very successful business together, and Carson recalled that Clarence was always happy, enjoyed working, and was a hard worker, putting in many hours at the store, friendly, got along with others, was very helpful, willing to help anyone in need, just like a great guy. Good guy, Clarence. Good guy brother, good guy co-worker, good guy. It was a very successful business that the two were running, but it wasn't very profitable, and it certainly wasn't enough to keep up with Clarence and his family's lavish lifestyle. The business also started to accrue an amount of debt that Clarence wasn't prepared for, leading to the family falling into deep debt. Clarence tried to do what he could to stay afloat and ended up selling the store and using that money to invest in an apartment building as well as several several grain elevators. But that also didn't pan out as he had hoped, leading to even more debt. That's what you get. And on top of that... Debt or dead? Debt. Oh. <laughs> How could leading to even more debt? That's why I was clarifying. So on top of that, other debt was rolling in... <laughs> <laughs> the Farmer State Bank of Mentone had won a $45,000 judgment against him. Clarence owed the Irwin Union Bank and the Trust Company of Columbus more than $9,000. Oh, 
The First State Bank of Morgantown reported that it held a defaulted mortgage on Clarence's home of $25,000. He also owed money to the Nashville State Bank, where he had once worked, but that amount was never disclosed. And on top of that, he also owed a half dozen lumber companies and wholesale suppliers unpaid bills ranging from $900 to $12,000. The Wabash Insurance Company, who had loaned Clarence money for him building the apartment complex, said that he submitted altered and fictitious bills to them, totaling between $131,000 and $200,000. And in June of 1970, he and his attorney even discussed the possibility of Clarence filing for bankruptcy, which he rejected. Well, that's stupid. So things are not going well. I'm assuming you didn't calculate what the total was that he owed me. No, I did not. (sighs) But then that's the perfect Michael Scott meme. I declare bankruptcy. You can't just say that. I didn't say it. I declared it. That's very funny. Okay. I'm laughing on the inside. All of our viewers who watch The Office will be like, yeah, yeah. Right. In October of 1970, just one month before that first fire, Sheriff Warren Roberts, Clarence's own brother, so his other brother. Right. It's had, his fourth son that we don't know about. <laughs> right. The brother. Okay. He had to come and repossess two of Clarence's cars. Awkward. Yeah. <laughs> so it was around this time that Clarence went out and purchased a $1 million life insurance policy on himself, in which he named his wife Geneva as the beneficiary. Which is better than him, like, declaring it on his wife, because that's when you're real suspicious. No, I know, but I'm just like, they probably tell you when you're getting this shit open that if you kill yourself, it doesn't count. Right. Which would make sense because I said suicide at the top of the episode, kind of gave it away, but you know. So that and brings he us- owed so much money. So much money. So I'm like, he didn't declare bankruptcy. <laughs> mm. So this brings us back to November 18th, 1970, the night of the fire. So earlier that day, a bank officer had gone to Clarence's house to discuss a note on which the bank had some suspicions that Clarence had forged his brother's signature. Mm. The one last remaining car that had not been repossessed was at the house, and the bank officer believed he saw Clarence inside, but no one answered the door. That is when, at 6.15 a.m., Ella Cummings, a neighbor of the Roberts, reported a small fire at the Roberts' property. When firefighters made their way into the home, they found a man with his limbs gone, supposedly burnt off due to the heat, and a shotgun laid across his chest. They chalked it up to suicide, obviously, because why else would a gun be there? But they also found some weird things. First off, and this is kind of gross. Quest- nope, never mind. No question? Mm-mm. Okay. If you have it, just... I answered it. <laughs> <laughs> I did that today. I rolled over to my coworker's desk. I was like, I have a question. I said, and as I rolled over here, I answered it on my own. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can leave this in. You can take it out. It depends on, you know, how funny you find this. I was about to ask if um, his head was gone. But then I remembered you described his hair, so (laughs) it wasn't gone. (laughs) No, his head's still there. Just the limbs. And if you, uh, this next sentence will let you know that the head's still there. So first off, (laughs) and this is kind of gross, they found one single tooth still hanging from a thread. Uh, Oh Oh. my God, every time my kids would be like, look, Miss Nils, my tooth is loose. I'd be like, get out of my face. (laughs) So fires typically never get hot enough to fully destroy teeth, just an FYI. I was going to say, isn't it, isn't it even like... Frag- so I did deep dives. Fragments of bones, too. Mm-hmm. Okay. A typical house fire has an average temperature of 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So that's 593 Celsius. Okay. Human teeth can withstand a temperature of 2,912 degrees, 100 and, or 1,600 bullshit, Celsius. because when you eat something hot... <laughs> your teeth don't burn off. Yeah, but they, like, feel funny. Oh, my God. So this means that it takes way more heat than a house fire can produce for teeth to be destroyed, Mm -hmm. which is why when people try to destroy bodies and burn them, they never realize the teeth will still be there. (sighs) They also found a gold Masonic ring underneath the body that was inscribed with the name Clarence Roberts. Mm -hmm. And this ring was something very important to Clarence. He had the high honor from the Masonic Lodge. His wife, Geneva, later said, quote, I am so certain it was him. They found his ring in the fire. He thought more of that ring than anything, than most anything. But that ring being there, I am satisfied it was him. But his other ring, his wedding band that he wore for more than 30 years, was never found. But those in the community just couldn't believe a man like Clarence would commit suicide. He seemed to have this ideal life. Yeah, he had money issues, but why would someone with all of that commit suicide? His money issues were so bad. I know. I'm like, I don't, I don't, like, close to a million dollars he had to owe. Oh, yeah. I'm like... Ugh. Yeah. So a close friend of Clarence said that he, Clarence, was ashamed of the debt he suddenly had found himself in. This man said that he saw Clarence crying and speaking of suicide as a means to, quote, make his wife the richest widow in Brown County. No, Especially with not- that $1 million life insurance he had taken out for himself. 
So I guess it sort of seems open and shut, right? Very well-to-do man, fell on hard times, took his life to help his family. Yeah. It may not be that easy. It seems pretty textbook. You would think. An autopsy was conducted on Clarence after that first fire in 1970, and this is where things get a little weird. Jack Bond was a very experienced coroner and mortician, and during his... James Bond. Jack Bond. Another Jack! Another Jack. Another Jack. So during the procedure, he started to discover some weird things while Clarence was on his embalming table. Bond had seen numerous suicides and fatal gunshots during his time working in this field. He was told that the gunshot had been found laying over his body, so he immediately went to look for a gunshot wound. But what was weird with Clarence was that Bond couldn't find a single gunshot wound anywhere on his body. Hmm. Through the autopsy procedure, it was- And his head was definitely still there. Definitely still attached. Okay. Yes. Through the autopsy procedure, it was determined that this man on the table had actually died of carbon monoxide poisoning before the fire. Oh. Things just wouldn't add up for Bond, so he refused to sign the death certificate, reporting it as a suicide when he wasn't able to find a wound to prove anything. And with no death certificate, Clarence's insurance policy wasn't able to be paid out. Mm Hmm. He also deemed definite identification of the body was impossible. Oh, because they got no teeth. One tooth. It's only got one tooth. <laughs> <laughs> there were also just some weird things going on with the body, so it was again exhumed on December 21st, 1970, and sent to Indianapolis for additional tests. This was being looked further into because the law was on the line. There's a dead man who hadn't died in a fire that had consumed his house. The life insurance wasn't going to be paid out to the grieving widow. And like I mentioned, there were some weird things going on with the body. I have a question. What? And maybe this is something you get to later. For carbon monoxide poisoning, could that, like, happen before, like, a fire starts? Like, if, could it build I'm up in I'm not sure. House? I mean, maybe. But I don't know if carbon monoxide is flammable. Yeah, I, I mean, I know it's a gas, but yeah. I don't know if it's, like, something... That well, it, like, is it because if you leave your stove on and all that gas is coming out, that's carbon monoxide, right? And then if you light something, it explodes. I think so. Mm. We are not scientists. Obviously. <laughs> so medical forensics experts were called in. To verify that this was, in fact, Clarence and that he had died by something other than suicide, they found old dental records of Clarence's and compared them to the body they had pulled from the fire. But he's got no teeth. He has one tooth. He's two. Just as a way to confirm that this was Clarence that they were about to exhume. To their shock, the dental records of Clarence and the teeth of this man did not match. To their shock? To further this, Clarence had most of his teeth, but was missing a good amount of them, but he still had a pair of dentures. So one of the teeth that he had, like, that had been removed was the tooth that they had found in the body, like, that same position. So, like, say your last molar, he got that one removed, that's the tooth they found in the body. So it shouldn't have been there. Right. If it were Clarence. Blood samples were also taken that showed that the dead man had blood type AB. Tests and blood samples were taken from Clarence's family, and it was determined by his military card that he'd not, he did not have blood type AB. He actually had B. The dead man also only had one kidney while Clarence had two. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was officially determined and confirmed that the man who had been found in the fire, the man believed to be Clarence, was not him. So where's Clarence? This mysterious unidentified man was buried in an unmarked grave. So then, that brings us to Could it many be the questions. Fourth unidentified child. <laughs> no, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, who was that man? Yeah. What happened to Clarence? Yeah. And where is Clarence? Correct. In 1972, just about two years after the autopsy, this mystery man was still being looked for because we also don't know who this mystery man is. Right. And at this time, one investigator working the case believes he knew who this mystery man was, John Cupsey of Brown County. After looking into Cupsey, <laughs> which may not be the right way to pronounce his name, it's C U P S E. So I'm going to say Cupsey. So looking into him, they thought he might be the mystery man. But just two years later, in 1974, the real John Cupsey was found alive and well. Okay, so not him. So back to the drawing board on who this man was. Authorities also looked into the possibility that this victim was 38-year-old drifter James Woodrow Hatcher from Kentucky. Hmm. A man who had disappeared in 1968. So a couple years before the fire. But x-rays helped determine that James was not the victim in the fire. Okay. Then in December of 1975, Clarence Roberts was indicted by a Brown County grand jury for the kidnapping and murder of this unidentified man found after the fire. Oh. But obviously it remained unserved as the investigators couldn't find Clarence. Yeah. So he's indicted, but he can't be served anything because they don't know where he is. Right. And all throughout this time, Geneva, Clarence's wife, was fighting to get his life insurance policy. I'm sure she was. She had been 100% sure that the man who had died in the fire was her husband. Mm. But without his body and also without a claim for if he was dead or not, she was kind of at a loss. She didn't have her husband and she didn't have his life insurance money either. So she was hurting pretty bad financially. I'm sure. She had to take a job working as a dishwasher. 
She filed many appeals to continue having her case looked at, trying to get the court to recognize that Clarence was dead and she was entitled to his life insurance. A trial date for the final appeal was set for May 2nd, 1979. This was going to help pick a jury who would listen to Geneva's case, but it was unable to produce an impartial jury. Because of that, the decision of the case was to be made by one judge who would be chosen by the Indiana Supreme Court. That judge ended up being Special Judge James Dixon. The trial date was rescheduled and finally took place on February 17th, 1980. And in this appeal, it was Geneva going against the insurance company. And the trial just wasn't good from her. It didn't start off well. She didn't really have a case to go off of, really, in the first place. So they looked at the records that came out about this mystery man and Clarence. So they had the non-matching dental records that the forensic experts had found. They produced them again, and still it told the same thing. There was, was no match say, between the I two. I mean, A for effort, but come on. They confirmed yet again the man in the fire was not Clarence. The insurance company also called forth an anthropologist. The anthropologist looked at the bones and found evidence of, quote, butchering marks on the charred bones, indicating that the limbs had been hacked off, not burned off, meaning that there had been some suspicious activity that had gone on with the body. An arson expert testified and gave proof that the fire had been sent intentionally, as the firefighters had first noticed when they entered the house. Mm -hmm. And three witnesses came forward, claiming that they had seen Clarence since his death. Oh. He was actually reportedly seen across the world and in various parts of the U.S. Mm. Some reports put him as far away as Mexico. Some reports put him as close as being near Mentone in Fulton County, a place where some of his now defunct businesses had been. Mm -hmm. One man, Robert Jr. Hellenberg, Hillenberg, who was a former Nashville resident at the time of the trial, was living in New Mexico, and he said that he saw Clarence in Las Palmas, Mexico in 1975. Hmm. One witness even reported him seeing at a bar in a nearby town just two days prior to the 1970 fire on November 17th. So this account gets a little weird. So this is two days before the fire. Wait, what fire? The first fire. The first fire. The fire. Okay. The yeah. fire. The fire. So two days before the fire. Mm -hmm. This witness said that he had overheard Clarence talking to a homeless man, telling him that he needed some odd jobs done and that he would pay him an unknown amount of money to complete these jobs. The person didn't overhear the amount. The homeless man agreed, and he and Clarence finished one last drink together. As the man and Clarence were leaving the bar, the man suddenly collapsed within just a few steps. Clarence immediately stated that he would take the man to the hospital. He pulled his car around, got the guy into the car, and he drove off before the ambulance that had been called for the man could arrive. Hmm. State police detective Donald Custer decided to look into this. and Stop. What? Shut up. His name is not Donald Custard. Donald Custer. Not Donald Custard. <laughs> no, but it's like, what? It's like Clue, like. Yeah, Professor, what was his name? I think it was Professor Cust Colonel. No, it was Colonel Mustard. Colonel, oh, maybe that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't there like a Civil War general or something named Custer? I thought there was like a. There's someone, right? I was like, oh, it was General <laughs> Mustard? Are you sure it's not custard? <laughs> it's Colonel Mustard, not Colonel, General Mustard. Colonel Mustard in the library with the candlestick. Yeah. <laughs> Colonel, yeah, definitely Colonel Mustard. No. <laughs> I was like, no way is this guy's name. It's not. <laughs> it's not. It's not. Yeah, so his name is Donald Custer. So he decided to look into this, and he found no evidence that any man had been brought to any hospital in a 300-mile radius that night. Mm-hmm. The judge ultimately ruled against Geneva due to the remaining question about whether Clarence was dead and the fact that everything surrounding his death was just too suspicious. And, okay, so the file fire was in 1975. 1970. 70. Why did, wait, I'm confused. I thought that guy said that he saw him in 1975. Yeah. So he should have been dead. So the fact that they're seeing him. Wait, but he saw him in a bar? Yeah. So it's like he shouldn't be alive. I understand. Right. You said right before the first fire. The fire. No, this bar part is before the fire. Not in 1975. No, the 1975 was just a guy who spoke at the trial saying that he saw Clarence. That was confusing. <laughs> okay, a man said he saw Clarence in 1975. Yes. He was just a witness at the trial. Okay. Another witness at the trial said, oh, I saw him two days before the fire. This is the situation. Oh, I did not catch that those were two separate people. <sighs> So the court ruled that there was insufficient evidence to prove that Clarence was dead and that Geneva would not get the insurance money. Almost exactly a decade after the first fire. So 1980. Yes. When the trial, right after the trial happened. Right after the trial. Okay. Okay. Almost exactly a decade later after the first fire and only a few months after the final appeal had been denied. Okay. On November 29th, 1980, mm -hmm. another fire erupted at the Roberts residence. I thought the first place was at a farm. It was a barn, but it's like, this is a new residence, so it's at the residence. Okay. Yeah. 
And when did they own the farm? I don't know. Okay. I feel like they would because at that time everyone owned houses. Right. Nowadays, no one owns houses. So it's a foreign concept to us. <laughs> I just didn't know if like the farm, like, because you said a farm in town. So I didn't know if it was just this like abandoned oh, place. Oh, no, they lived there. Okay. But it just happened to be a farm that was in the town. Got it. So when the small town fire department tackled the flames and got it under control this time, they again went in and found a body. One that was confirmed to belong to Geneva Roberts, Clarence's widow. Okay. But there was another body in the ash. A body that was determined to be Clarence Roberts. Again. All the limbs there? Yeah. <laughs> Iron. Heads too? Hmm? Heads too? Yes. Heads were never removed. <laughs> <laughs> heads are always attached to bodies I in this know. story. I know a head's not a limb, but I think of, when you say limbs removed, I just think anything that's not the torso is gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. The, all the heads are always All the naked. parts are there. All the parts burned. are on this guy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so a weird fact about this one, he was ID'd. So this second time, okay. Clarence was ID'd by the same pathologist who had testified that Clarence had died in the first fire back in 1970. So this guy was like, oh, yeah, he died in 1970. Ooh. And then he's like, oh, he died in 1980. Wait, I have a question. Sorry. Yes. It wasn't who... I know the guy who did the embalming. Mm -hmm. Jack Bond. Not this same guy. No. Okay. Um... I don't know, actually, because in the second time around, they didn't list his name. Okay. Because I know he was, like, the one to be like, hey, no. But I don't sketch. think it was because this guy's a pathologist uh -uh. and the other guy was a coroner and um, what's the other thing? Medical examiner? No, that's – I thought those coroner are the same and, Oh, and, like, was a morgue person. M mortician? Thank you. Yes. So he's a coroner and mortician. This guy's a pathologist. Was the – so was his death certificate already signed by the time uh – -uh. No. Mm -mm. Okay. Okay. Mm -mm. okay. Okay, that's what I thought. Just wanted to make sure that that was my correct. Yeah, no, it wasn't signed. Okay. So it was believed that both Geneva and Clarence had died of smoke inhalation pretty quickly. A well, that would make more sense. That one would, yeah. Yeah. But pretty quickly, a forensic pathologist was able to accurately ID the body of Geneva's, and she had a blood alcohol content of 0.2. That's a lot. That's really high. The legal driving limit is, is 0.08. Oh, something. Point, yeah, 0 0.08. Mm -hmm. Point 0.1 is when you're like... Kind of not Alcohol great. poisoning, right? Yeah. 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 So point two. But once again, the body of Clarence was under debate. And he also had a blood alcohol content of point three. So he obviously had to have been alive at some to point. consume it. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, because I'm thinking like, oh, if she killed her husband and it's been he's been dead and oh, then this fire yeah, yeah, yeah. broke out, he obviously couldn't have like he would have had to have been recently alive, I guess I should say. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they both had drank yeah and this fire was clearly arson when detectives were looking at the house and the fire and looking for a cause they were able to clearly follow burn patterns from geneva's bed to an adjacent room where clarence had been found then down a hallway and out the back door of the house does that mean that like someone poured something mm -hmm. in like in that path yep okay based on this investigators determined that geneva had been murdered and that turpentine had been used to ignite the fire and who had ignited it, be it Clarence or a third party, was never found. Though Detective Dave Anderson believes that a third party is responsible. Whoa, 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 whoa. Pump the brakes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the question, which is, ask away and I can explain. <laughs> so they find these two bodies. Uh-huh. The, the Geneva. Mm hmm And she's been murdered. Mm-hmm. How has she been murdered? From the fire. Well, they believe. I will get to it. Okay. I will get to, like, theories and stuff. Okay. I'll, then I'll let you get there because that's where my questions are. <laughs> oh, I got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I explain. So now at this point, family members were brought in to help ID the bodies as well. Mm. Geneva was positively identified. We also have forensics to help prove this. But all of the family members reported that, again, this man that was found was not Clarence. So they said, first guy's not Clarence mm -hmm. and this guy's not Clarence. Yep. Okay. But police stood by their ID and determined that the forensic evidence they found confirmed that it was Clarence. So they're like, no, no, no. You're wrong. Uh -huh. We have ID. It's him. Our cases are oddly similar with that. Really? Yeah, you'll see. Huh. On December 4th, 1980, criminal pathologist Dr. John Pless, bone and forensic specialist Dr. Clyde Snow, and a dentist Dr. Clay Stuckley spoke at a news conference in Indianapolis. They declared that the two victims found in the 1980 fire had been Geneva and Clarence Roberts. They had compared x-rays and matched dental records. Criminal pathologist Dr. John Pless said that there was, quote, no margin for error in IDing the body of Clarence. Though the whole Roberts family continued to refute this decision, and even after the autopsy, they refused to claim the body. 
The family requested the remains of the John Doe from the first fire, mm -hmm. the unidentified man who had been buried in an unmarked grave. Mm -hmm. they, ba they buried that John Doe alongside Geneva under a gravestone proclaiming Clarence Roberts. Wait, wait. <laughs> I know. Wait. I know. And this part is going to be... Okay. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> they know that the man in the first fire wasn't him. Correct. But they still took those remains uh -huh. and buried them under the gravestone for Clarence Roberts. But after the second guy got burned. Uh-huh. And they put the death, the date of death as November 29th, 1980, the date of the second fire. So man dies in first fire. They take him, put him under Clarence's gravestone and say he died at the second fire. Uh-huh. Yep. <laughs> okay. Yep. <laughs> I, think, I think I got it. No, I had the same reaction. I was like, you clearly said the first guy wasn't him. You You're didn't... clearly saying the second guy's not him. But now but you're then taking... you say, just kidding, I want that guy instead? Yeah. That's like <laughs> it's like when you give you have two dogs, you give them a treat, and the dog's like, no, I want that one, even though you just gave them the same treat. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, you know, you give so you give one dog the bone uh -huh. and then it goes and takes it. You give the second dog the bone, but then the first dog wants the other dog's bone, mm -hmm. even though it's the same bone, they have the same thing. Yeah. It's like that. But these are two different men. Well, I know, but <laughs> ideally it's like, oh no, we don't want that one anymore. Yeah, we, we want, want this, this one. one. Yeah. But they never claimed that second body, even though, oh, well, they they already said the second body wasn't him. But right. they also said the first body wasn't him. But they wanted the first body. How could they do that? I don't know. I don't know. Because if he was, if he was declared that he wasn't him, how can you just be like, no, I'm going to take this body? I have no idea. But yeah, so they took that first body and gave it the second body's death date. When I look up weird laws for this, I'm going to see if something's come up. Please because do. Because I feel like there's a few laws that should be put in place after this whole thing. <laughs> Wait, you can't just take the unmarked John Doe. Right. <laughs> you can't just say, just kidding, I changed my mind. No, take backsies, okay? Right, and it's been 10 years. Right. So my next sentence. So what the hell happened? <laughs> How did Clarence die twice? So there are many theories as to what could have happened. Mm -hmm. Many swirled, but most authorities had one theory that they believed is, pro is probably what happened with the first fire. So Clarence wasn't dead and was scared that he soon would lose everything he had worked so hard to obtain, and he didn't want to face that and the debt that kept growing and looming. He was also too prideful to actually kill himself. Okay. So it is believed that he staged his death in which he actually killed a homeless man in his place. That makes sense. So it took the homeless man. That's like the man. only thing you've said so far that makes sense. <laughs> Sawing off his arms and legs to make identification harder. Again, that makes sense. Yes. He then placed the shotgun on the man to make it look like it had been suicide. Mm -hmm. Then he torched the house and the man along with it. It is believed that this was the man who we had met at the bar two days before the first fire. From the one witness, not the same one from 1975. Ding, ding, ding. Yes. Got it. <laughs> Someone unknown who okay. even claimed that after Clarence had set the house on fire with the man inside, he ran into the woods and hid, watching it burn from the woods. How do I know that? I don't know. That's why it says someone unknown. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then we have the second fire. Did Clarence say it? You know, who knows? <laughs> at this point, who knows? So we have our second fire. Was that other body Clarence's? And had he murdered Geneva then accidentally died? Had they both been murdered? Had the two committed suicide together to allow their children to collect their insurance and money? So that's what I was going to say. If it happened right after she got that final appeal denied. Right. It was like a month later. Yeah. So this is what many believe. Okay. So Clarence, who was wanted for murder because of the homeless man, he had been served, well, he had been issued the papers, but it was never served. Mm -hmm. So he went on the run. Mm -hmm. But after being on the run, he was out of money. He had nowhere to go. So he returned to Nashville after being in hiding for 10 years. That's bold. Yes. But when he returned, he found Geneva with another man. Oh. And murdered her. Plot twist. Yeah. So murdered her again before setting the house on fire. But you've been gone for 10 years. <gasps> right. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you didn't let her in on your little plan. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it would make sense if... We don't think it's Clarence. Mm -hmm. It would make sense that there's this mystery man. So Clarence came in, killed Geneva, killed the mystery man, and booked it out of the house. Oh. Because mm -hmm. we it might not be Clarence. Right. Okay. Even though the police say it is, his family's like, that's not him. So there are some weird theories about this one. Mm -hmm. Neighbors of Geneva's claimed that a not Clarence, another man, had been living on and off with Geneva in her rented house for the past six years. Her neighbors were adamant that this was not Clarence. This was just another man she was seeing. But this mystery man rarely showed his face. He always had a hood on when he entered the house. So neighbors were never able to get a good look at him. 
Family and friends started to say that when they went to visit Geneva, she would usually step out onto the porch to have their conversations rather than inviting them inside, regardless of how long the conversations were. A local reporter, Helen Ayers, befriended Geneva and also tried to be invited into her house. Ayers visited Geneva on four different occasions but was never once invited inside. Police were also very suspicious of this, so they began surveilling surveilling her. Surveilling. That's mm-hmm. a weird... Yeah, that mm-hmm. didn't sound right. Surveilling her. They thought that she was in on the crime. So they believed that Clarence had fed and that he would eventually return. And they have this mystery man. So they had their suspicions that the mystery man was Clarence and they wanted to be there watching when he somehow revealed himself. Through the surveillance, they started to notice Geneva buying large quantities of beer. This typically wouldn't be too weird, but she was diabetic and didn't Ooh. particularly like this kind of alcohol, but it was Clarence's favorite. In a small town would know that. Right. And it was Clarence's favorite. Hmm. But no matter how long the police were outside, they never saw another man enter the house. Well, obviously, when they served the warrant for his arrest, does that not give them probable cause to go in her house? Because they don't, not her, because he's the one who's charged and they have no proof that he's the one going into her house. So you can't just go into an innocent person's house. And it, so it wasn't, it was under her name then? Yeah, because she was now renting this house. Oh. Uh, mm-hmm. Okay. But though all this was weird, Geneva's sister, who lived in an adjacent yard, like they had adjacent yards together, said that she would hear Geneva talking to a man, but that man wasn't Clarence. She knew Clarence's voice and she knew this wasn't him. So when the second a fire occurred, it made sense that the other man wasn't really Clarence, but rather the new man that Geneva had been seeing. Mm -hmm. So Carson, Clarence's brother, doesn't believe this man found in the second fire was his brother. He said, quote, there was a fellow that came and went talking about the guy that was living with Geneva for six years. He said that no one in the family even knew this man's name. Bob White, Clarence's nephew, believes he died in the first fire. His children also believe now that he died in the first fire. Detective Sergeant Don Custer of the Indiana State Police believes Clarence died in the second fire. Clarence's sister-in-law, Alberta Roberts, believes he is still alive. Oh, my God. (laughs) Some people believe that Clarence came back for Geneva and was actually the man who died in 1980. So, that second fire... Others claim to have seen him alive despite this evidence of his death. So some more sightings. Okay, so we're going to go back in time for these new sightings. An acquaintance claimed that he saw Clarence and an unknown woman in his tavern in April of 1972. Others claim to have seen him in 1974 and 1975. In 1980, a man from Bloomington said that he saw Clarence eating at a restaurant in Mexico back in 1975. I talk about Bloomington. Oh, so now two men have seen him in Mexico in 1975. This man. I thought you said New and the Mexico. Other man. No, in Mexico. For some reason, I heard New Mexico. Oh, no. They saw Clarence eating at a restaurant in Mexico. In Mexico. Back in 1975. Not the same guy. I don't think so. I thought so at first, too. But I, after reading it more, I don't think so. Okay. So maybe he's like living in Mexico. Insurance investigator William F. Mitchell said that throughout the years, he received many different reports of people seeing Clarence, reporting that he was living in Mexico. New Mexico, and even West Germany. But what is for sure is that the man buried under his gravestone died in 1970 and is not Clarence. So what happened to him? Was he the man who died in 1980? Did he fake his death and escape to live his life somewhere else? He once confided in a friend that he had over $100,000 in a Swiss bank account. Was he going to use that money to run off and start a new life somewhere else? The world may never know. (sighs) There are two episodes of Unsolved Mysteries on this guy. (laughs) One is in season one, episode nine, episode 16 overall. It aired December 14th, 1988. And then another one was in season 14, episode 156, episode 562 overall. And it aired on April 7th, 2010. That is the strange deaths of Clarence Roberts. So what do you think? I kind of think the theory of Geneva was seeing this other man. Clarence was kind of being an asshole but was like after 10 years you should still be mine so i think he returned home found her with another man killed them both and peaced out and is living his life somewhere in mexico even with all the people saying like the scientist people saying that it's yes because his family is like that's not him but he's burned yeah but they still i don't know they say it's not him and they did so horribly of a job IDing him in the first time, like the first place, like that pathologist who was like, oh, yeah, this is him in 1970. And then yeah, 1980, they're like, oh, this is him. The guy came back and was like, nah, man, because he doesn't have all that other stuff. Yeah. And then now. Well, what do you think happened? 
I think that the most logical explanation is the explanation. And there, there's like a thing, like the most obvious answer is oh. the correct one or whatever. What, that him and Geneva both died in the fire? The yeah, second fire? The second one. And especially like if people are saying that like they didn't really see the guy going in and out. No right. one actually met him. Which is also very weird. Right. And then it's like if they find if they lost this final appeal and they didn't have anything else. Right. And that was it. They were out of money. Then fuck it. Let's peace. Because I do also see the theory of like he fakes his own death and then he comes back, you know, to like live with her, yeah, spend yeah, life yeah. with her. He might have even told her of the plan. Oh, probably. I mean, those are my two theories. Very drastically different theories, but I feel either of them are possible. I could see, like, if someone found... No, I don't know. I just feel like with a burned body, I'm like, you gotta... Yeah. I definitely think it was him the second time. You do? Yeah. Yeah, but so very weird. His limbs. <laughs> yeah, actually, I don't know why they never... They never mentioned, like, fingerprints. And he probably took the teeth out so that they couldn't ID him through dental records. Hmm. Did we have fingerprinting at that point? Mm-hmm. Oh, we did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. They should have fingerprinted him then. If they had fingerprints to compare. Oh, unless it like burned him. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So yeah, that's Clarence Roberts. What do you have for me tonight, Mackenzie? Okay. So I thought this just was your like run of the mill missing girl disappearance thing. Okay. My God. Are you okay? Oh. <laughs> You know, sometimes when you breathe wrong, <laughs> that was that. Woo! <laughs> <Are you okay? laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I've been over my cough for like a couple of days now. That like sounded like you joked. Oh my God. Yeah. Like, you know, sometimes you just breathe. You just die. <laughs> that happened the other day at work. I just all of a sudden started coughing and I was like, I'm sorry. I breathed wrong and I like was dying i was like i'm just gonna go out to the hall real quick i joke on my spit a lot yeah <laughs> yeah it wasn't great that's what happened okay yeah. okay cool. all right run of the mill yeah <laughs> but it's not and kind of like yours there seems to be a pretty obvious answer okay but then it goes into a completely different direction and that's the one we stick with and i'm like but that doesn't seem right <laughs> okay so it's solved technically oh. but i don't think they have the right person Okay. You'll have to tell me if you think they also don't have the right person. Okay, Detective Cap on. Yes. Okay, so if you traveled to Bloomington, Indiana, Uh you would most likely see hundreds of pictures of 19-year-old Jill Berman. Her picture was on sliding doors of grocery stores, bulletin boards, at the bank, post office, telephone poles, and mailboxes. Erware. What? Erware. Erware. Her name came up in public meetings and in conversations across town. People would speak in hushed tones and hush tones Mm-mm. This is why I never. I know I will never be able to do well on a TV show. No. One because the whole stage fright thing, but then the other because of this. <laughs> oh yeah, like news anchors and stuff when it's live. And I just like, you know, you watch those funny outtakes of them oh, just God. like laughing, yeah. and I'm like, I would never stop laughing. No, I laugh out of sheer nervousness. Remember when I did the news in middle school? Oh my God! Yeah, that memory came flooding back. Yep, morning news every morning. Because you were one of the representative people. Mm-hmm. Were we seventh grade? Yeah. I, was seventh grade. I think it was seventh grade. Because there was an annoying kid who was older than us. He goes, you were funny, funny looking. And I'm like, Ew. you're ugly. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I remember because I remember voting for you. Oh, thank you. You better have. If you didn't vote for me, we wouldn't be friends. I don't know if there's any other options except for you. At the time, no, not seventh grade. <laughs> I was like the only person who ran. I was your only choice. <laughs> oh my God. I totally forgot about that. Yeah, I did too yeah. until like this exact moment because I remember sure. laughing once and we couldn't stop laughing. Okay, I'm going to try this line one more time. Okay. People would speak in hushed tones and outraged exclamations about the disappearance of Jill Berman. Got it. Got it. She had just finished her freshman year at Indiana University, Bloomington, and she was described by her loved ones as outgoing, athletic, and an avid cyclist. On May 31st, 2000, Jill's mother, Marilyn Berman, left for work at the IU Foundation, Indiana University, around 8.30 that morning. Jill was just waking up as her mother was leaving, and her mom asked Jill if she had time to mow the lawn since it was going to rain later. Jill was going to go for a bike ride and then head into work at the IU Recreation Center at noon. And then she was going to meet her father and her grandfather at 3 for a late lunch. Jill did not show up to work or to the lunch. 
When her father came home, he found her red backpack sitting by the door. It had her money and her ID in it, so he wasn't sure what she could be off doing without these items with her. Right. The TV was on in the living room, and the lights in the upstairs bathroom were still on. Jill's parents thought maybe she was with friends and forgot to let them know, but when nightfall came and she still wasn't home, they became very concerned. That just sounds like my episode in Arkansas with, like, all the lights on, all of her stuff Mm. still there with Mm -hmm. the money. Yep. They called friends and family, but no one had seen her. So then they called the police and reported her missing. They waited and waited to get a call from the police or anybody with any information about where Jill was and if she was okay. Marilyn Berman told reporters, quote, I stayed up all night cleaning house. I just felt like any minute she'd come walking in the door. Ugh. Being in a small town, news of Jill's disappearance spread quickly through the community. By Friday, hundreds of volunteers from all over Indiana and surrounding states came together to help search. Jill's brother, 21-year-old Brian Burnham, got together with students from IU to make flyers and hang them up across the city. When the local bicycle groups heard Jill was missing, they took to the streets to join the search. Cricket Howes, a member of the bike group that Jill was a part of, D-Cycles, said that they were looking any where members would possibly go to ride. He told reporters, quote, how did they get to her? That's what's so bizarre about this. What went on there? Jill is strong. She's so strong. At 5 p.m. that day, Jill's bike was found by a jogger who saw it in a cornfield. Mm. The bike was found actually in Ellettsville, 10 miles southwest of Bloomington on Wednesday, well before anyone knew about her disappearance. So the guy found the bike on Wednesday and kept it. Okay, so he found the bike. Found the bike on Wednesday. And didn't then she know she went was missing, missing when? On Wednesday. Oh, okay. And he found it, didn't know she was missing. Oh. And was like, oh, cool, free bike. Yeah. And took it home. Gotcha. When he saw the news story, he's like, oh, fuck, that's mm-hmm. my bike. <laughs> and was like, hey. Gotcha. I got the bike. Mm-hmm. Police dogs were brought into the area where the bike was found, but they were not able to pick up Jill's scent. And so by the time he came fo- – so I think she went missing on a Wednesday, mm-hmm. and he came forward that Friday. So it had been two days. Two days. So, okay. But weird that they couldn't pick up her scent. Yeah, I, didn't, I wasn't sure if there was like a – Like a like a time frame? Thank you. Time. I was about to I say timeline, and I was like, that's not it. <laughs> I don't think so. I I mean, maybe, or maybe if it rains really bad or something, but I feel like two days isn't that long. I was just reading on um, this fun account follows us. It's the one that I think oh. got confused about what we were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they actually have, like, just really cool information. And so their posts are long, but it's, like, interesting to read. Mm-hmm. And they talked about, you know, the idea of animals being able to kind of see, you know, paranormal things a lot better than people oh, can. Oh, absolutely. And That's why Roy's always staring at walls. Right. And he was talking about dogs and, like, how dogs pretty much have, even in the whole animal kingdom, one of the best sense of smells. And so it would make sense that they might be able to pick up on things and they can see a lot better in the dark than we can. Yeah. And if that's when ghosts are coming out. <laughs> Oh, they're just so, so cute. Two days later, it might still be there. I feel I like I it know. would be. I feel yeah. like at least like a trace of it. Yeah. Because people do that all the time. They'll bring dogs in who, like for people who have been missing for a little bit longer. I feel like we've read stories at least like that. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. Well, they weren't able to pick up on her scent or anything. <clears throat> uh, and police couldn't find helmet. There was no gloves. There was nothing belonging to Jill besides the bike. Just bike. Just the bike. A reward for any information regarding her disappearance went from $25,000 to $50,000 within the first week that she went missing. Wow. It's almost like how we went from 25,000 downloads to 50,000 downloads in four months. Hell yeah, that's so exciting. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you. About 50 officers from state and local agencies were working on the case. By the following Monday, 10 agents from the FBI joined the investigation. So, sidebar, as I was reading through this, I was thinking, like... I had, like, the thought to myself, okay, yeah, she's, like, a young white woman Mm -hmm. getting national attention. Mm -hmm. And and I'll get to this a little bit later, but in one of the articles that I read, there was also another girl around the same time. Of course. And... Who probably didn't get any attention. No. That is just so Granted, I don't... I think she had very similar characteristics to Jill, but... Was she not white, though? Was she a minority? No, I think she was. That's what I found so strange. Oh. I'm and not, we're not I'm, saying that only white women should be found no. when they're missing, as some people have misconstrued, one man misconstrued. Of course it was a man. Of <laughs> course. We are just saying that the disproportionality of minorities never being looked into as opposed to white people mm-hmm. 
That's what we're saying. I'm not going to lie, though. I don't know because I was focusing on this. And right. it was like, I just saw it happened to be next to the other, like the article that I was reading. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it describes her or not. It just, I know that she disappeared around the same time and was around the same age. Oh. So, but Weird. I'll get into that a little bit later. Okay. So Bloomington Police Captain Bill Parker told the Associated Press, quote, what we're doing now is good old fashioned legwork. We just have kind of a loose timeline, but other than that, we don't have much. Jill's parents sat at home waiting for a phone call, a tip, anything that would tell them what happened to their daughter. Her father, Eric Berman, told the Associated Press, quote, if someone has taken her and has her, we need them to know that we want her back. Mm -hmm. There's not much in terms of physical evidence that could help investigators with this case, so they really had to rely mostly on witnesses coming forward with any information, which Mm -mm. is about as good as not having physical evidence. Right, exactly. So they conducted dozens of searches and received over 3,000 tips about the case. A few days after Jill went missing, a digital radio was found in a parking lot of a Bloomington church. It was believed that the radio belonged to Jill. It was the same model and color as the one that she usually took with her on bike rides. Okay. When the radio was found, another churchgoer said that they had noticed a dark-colored pickup truck drive out of the lot very quickly. Authorities didn't really believe that it was linked to Jill's case, but they still wanted to identify and speak to the driver anyway. Well, yeah, if it's, you know, if you don't have anything. Right. One of the viable tips that came through was from an 18-year-old woman who had claimed that two weeks after Jill had vanished, she was walking past an old black Ford pickup truck in Ellettsville around 1030 at night, so the same place her bike was found. Okay. The driver tried to grab her arm and attempt to pull her inside the truck. Oh. She was able to break free and escape. Authorities were not even... They weren't able to make progress on her case either and thought that maybe it could be connected to Jill's. Yeah, maybe. Ellettsville is about three miles from where Jill's bike had been found. So authorities' theory was that Jill had been hit by a pickup truck driven by someone who might have been under the influence of drugs or alcohol while she had been riding her bike on the morning of the 31st. Okay. However, the damage to her bike had been minimal, so it was unlikely that she was struck while she was riding it. Mm -hmm. Investigators think that she could have been hit while she was either resting or working on her bike on the side of the road. The area where the bike was found was not in the direction of a typical loop that Jill would make because it would have taken her through traffic in town. Okay. They also believe that her body could possibly be have been dumped in southern Monroe County's Salt Creek. Divers extensively sh- searched the creek where they believed her body may be and couldn't come up with anything. Mm-hmm. Another case that maybe was related to Jill's was an incident that occurred in Bowling Green, Kentucky. I don't know how far that is from Indiana, so I... I think... They touch. We need our map. We need our map. And I, as I'm writing this, I'm like, I'm not, I don't know if this is close enough for them to, like, is it stupid that they're relating it to this case in, in Bowling Green, Kentucky? Or does it, like, make sense because they're actually really close to each other? Let's look up a map of the U.S. because we don't have our map. <laughs> it's packed away. I know where it is. Oh, yeah. Indiana's, like, right on top of Kentucky. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, possibly. So, like, yeah. Super possible. So, it makes sense. Okay, yeah. cool. We are so bad without the map. So Bowling Green, Kentucky. (laughs) Geography, yes. (laughs) Geography. So apparently a woman there had been purposefully struck while she was riding her bike by an unknown motorist. The man had tried to drag the woman into his car but was chased away by a witness. I would like to hope that if this happened to me that there would be a witness nearby that could chase somebody off. I would hope so. A composite of the man was added to Jill's missing posters in hopes that someone would recognize him. Mm -hmm. So... They, I think they just put him as, like, a person, a person of interest in her case. Right. A year had passed and little progress had been made on the investigation, and Jill's body still had not been found. Jeez. The last time Jill had been seen, she had short brown hair, blue eyes, and around 5'7 and 120 pounds. Lucky bitch. <laughs> she was wearing a green plastic bicycle helmet, black riding shorts, and a red sleeveless jersey with wide white vertical stripes on both sides. How old was she? 19. Oh, okay. She was also wearing a pair of black Diodora riding shoes with Velcro straps and a pair of black riding gloves. Jill's father, Eric Berman, told reporters, quote, to be waiting a whole year and still not knowing where she is. You know, if she is deceased, we could have a service service for her. There is a need for that. It's been a year and we need to know where she is. We need a resolution, even though this will never be over for us. Right. Oh, I know. I feel bad. Investigators said that most of the tips and information that they were getting was hearsay. Some information was heard fourth, fifth, sixth hand knowledge. Oh, mm -hmm. Which makes it very difficult to track the information back to the original source. Jill's story appeared on America's Most Wanted, Unsolved Mysteries, 
and Greta Van Struesterson, Struester and Renz. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Program crime scene fo on Fox News. Oh, wow. Some of the investigators had their suspicions of who it might be. Yura Klaus had gotten out of prison shortly. Klaus? Yes. I say his name a lot. Yura Klaus? Klaus. Except he sucks. Oh, damn yeah. it. No, no. <laughs> he had just gotten out of prison shortly after Jill went missing. Mmm, convenient. Mm -hmm. Wait. After she went missing. Yes. Never mind, not convenient. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Had the same thought. <laughs> he had been arrested in April 1999 for beating and kicking a woman who was identified as his girlfriend outside of a bar downtown. Good. He was charged with felony battery, battery on a police officer resulting in bodily injury, and attempted battery by bodily waste. Ew. During his arrest, Klaus threatened to kill the police officer and rape and kill his grandmother, mother, wife, and children. What the hell? He was sentenced to 18 months in prison. <laughs> My God. Yeah. Apparently, he was going to get out after like a day. But then there was this whole petition to be like, no, no. Good. And so he stayed. Good. Yeah. If it had been anyone other than a police officer, he would have been out. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Witnesses came forward in June of 2000 to say that Klaus had told them about his involvement in the crime. So investigators continued to investigate Klaus as a possible sus suspect, but he wouldn't officially be named as a suspect until March of 2002. So two years later. Oh, wow. Okay. So Wendy Owings had been arrested and was facing armed robbery and drug-related charges. So I was unable to find why police believe that she had information about Jill's disappearance. Again, this is one of those things that it's all of a sudden like, this happened on this day. I'm like, but why did they even ask? Yeah. Like, how did, yeah. you know? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. So on March it's 20... Like, give me the reasoning why. Right. Couldn't figure it out. On March 22nd, 2002, Owings claimed responsibility for the murder of Jill Berman. Owings claimed that she and two others, Yura Klaus and Alicia Evans, were responsible for Jill's death. Mm -hmm. Police already knew about the other two individuals because both had made comments to other people about Berman separately. Oh. And those people had told the police. Interesting. Owings told FBI agent Gary Dunn that she, Klaus, and Evans were driving around in Bloomington smoking crack cocaine and <laughs> drinking beer. Good. Oh, sorry. I guess I should give a trigger warning. Drug use. Should I read that sentence again? No. No. Okay. I think you're okay. Okay. Klaus had taken his eyes off the road to watch Evans struggle to inject a cocaine and water concoction into the top of her hand <clears throat> when they heard a thump. <gasps> The group thought that they hit a dog and stopped the truck to take a look. Klaus had become agitated and upset when he realized that he had hit a woman. <gasps> the group decided the best idea was to get rid of the body. Of course, yeah. That's what every normal, rational person does. From this point right here, you're going to be like, this is the end of her story. Oh my God, this was so short. Okay. So these dumbasses, I'm assuming because they were high on drugs, they did not think properly. Yeah. They decided they're going to get rid of the body. Mm-hmm. Probably could have just left it. I don't think anybody saw them. <laughs> yeah. And so they wrapped Jill's body in an industrial plastic sheeting and secured it with bungee cords. Why'd they have industrial plastic sheeting? I'm assuming it was in his truck. Wow. I don't know why they would have had it. It's kind of Dexter-esque. Yeah. They put the body and the bike into the back of the truck and drove around trying to find a good spot to dump everything. Mm -hmm. They ended up at the North Fork of Salt Creek, where all three of them took turns stabbing Berman and placing her body headfirst into the creek. Why? I don't know. Okay. I have no idea. Okay. Like, okay, I guess this is kind of morbid. Was she killed, like, when she was hit? Mmm. We don't know. They don't have a body. Right. Duh. Okay. And this is just her story. Mm-hmm. It, nothing gets cleared up. Good. Love those. Just so you know. Great. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> totally on board for this. Yep. <laughs> just figured I'd let you know now. Thank you. Stop <laughs> me if you have questions. I don't, I will not be able to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> so Agent Dunn submitted a plausible cause affidavit. I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. But I figured it means, like, they have probable cause to say that these people were responsible. Okay. That's what I'm assuming. But it detailed a wing's confession and listed names of several Bloomington residents. The confession also seemed to be cor corroborated. Good job. Did close. I do it? I mean, close. Okay. It wasn't a hundred, but we like we weren't using W's this time. Okay, cool, 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 cool. I like felt better that time. We used maybe one W, but one R this time. So. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Progress. Okay, cool. <laughs> I realize I also can't say it very well in my head, so that doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> so like I can say it right here, and it comes out right here. I 
Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's like the more common thing. You like, right. I can say it in my head. My mouth just won't make the words. That's how I feel with um, fra- fragile. Fragile. Sometimes I say fragile because my, my head gets all confused. When I see the word, I'm like, I know what this word is. <laughs> but it's I'm being fancy and I'm saying fragile. Fragile. I feel like a loser. <laughs> <laughs> fragile it just my mouth doesn't want to do that yeah it's weird with its r's yeah so anyway (laughs) it was checked off it was verified Mm, there you go by what investigators already knew about the case i witnessed statements and some of the physical evidence that they did have 22 of the 46 individuals named in the affidavit came forward and told investigators that one of the three suspects so either klaus owings or evans had told them about their involvement in the cover-up Klaus had told five people. Owings had told four people. Evans told 13. Told them, like, about their involvement? Mm -hmm. Why? They're stupid. So that's what, 19? No. 22. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought there was one. Yep, Yep, 22. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Yeah. And they're all saying that these three people came to them separately. It's not like all of them told the same person. Yeah. It's 22 different people that were told about this from someone who was involved. Right. I wonder if there was any overlap. Like, you know, if one person told this person and this person. Maybe. They seem to run in the same circle, so I would assume, but I don't know. Same circle, 22. Yeah. That's a lot of people to know. So these confessions all allegedly happened independent of each other. And, of course, it prompted a massive search of Salt Creek just north of Lake Monroe. Well, duh. Like, I would hope it would. Right. (laughs) So the search for Jill's body pretty much ended as quickly as it began. Investigators had to cut it short because of flooding in the area, and they couldn't resume until July and August of 2002. And this happened in May? March. March. I knew it was one of the M's. Yeah. And they're also doing this a whole year later, right? Two years later. Two. Jeez. Yeah. Two and a half, almost. So during the search, investigators found a large sheet of industrial plastic consistent with Owings' story. Mm -hmm. And in September of 2002, 100 million gallons of water from Salt Creek was drained and investigators found another sheet of industrial plastic, a bungee cord, and a knife. But no body. No body. Wow. No body. But all the things that were... Would make sense with their story. Right. Agent Dunn presented all of this information in the affidavit to prosecutors. Owings, Klaus, and Evans were all administered polygraph examinations, and when they were asked if they had knowledge of Jill's disappearance, the results showed that Owing had been truthful when she acknowledged that she did, and it showed that Klaus and Evans were both deceptive when they said that they did not know anything. Oh, that's interesting. But later on, Owings recanted her statement. I am not sure if this happened before or after they found Jill's body. Oh, so we do find the body. We do find the body. It was very difficult for me to determine if, like, she took it back, they found it, and they're like, oh, yeah, that was fake. Mm -hmm. Or if finding it was what made her recant. Okay. I It's hard to tell. I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. Because they probably, before the body was found, thought, well, we can't be charged with no body. So I'm assuming she started to say something because she had those other charges against her. Mm, Okay. And... They didn't have a body, but they had all these other things. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that's where, like, the probable cause comes from. Oh, yes, yes, yes. The probable cause happened. Yes. But then they found her body. But it was in Morgan County, and it was just north of Paragon, which is 30 miles southwest of Indianapolis, but still north of Bloomington. So from what I gathered, even though my geography skills are not good. Yeah, maybe you shouldn't be trusted. So here, I'm going to show you, like, a... Pretend this box is Indiana. Okay. Okay. So Bloomington's right here. Over on the left side. Uh Uh-huh. And then Paragon or whatever is up here. Right above it to the north. Yeah. It's in the county right next to it. So it's not like super far. Mm -hmm. And it didn't show on the map that I found, but I think like the Salt Lakes and all the other shit is down here. So more to the south. Yeah. We're still all kind on the left side. Correct. We're all on the same side, but she was found way in the north. Okay. Not where everything else was found. Okay. With the finding of the body, they are like, yeah, this story has been fabricated. Whether it was said when they found it, after, I don't know, but they decided afterwards, yeah, she made it up. Why? 
She said that she was she was under pressure from investigators. Well, why did they think that she made it up? So that's what I mean. I I was I thought from what it sounded like, I thought she like recanted it Mm -hmm. and then they found the body did they find evidence though that the body had been stabbed we'll get there okay (laughs) yeah but despite everything else all the people coming forward saying yeah they said they did this Mm -hmm. and the things that they found in salt creek right are very consistent with the story Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. monroe county prosecutor carl salzman decided not to pursue charges against any of the prime suspects okay and according to newspaper reports, Jill was identified by her dental records. Mm-hmm. And this is where I'm like, this don't make no sense. Okay. So investigators believe that Jill had been stripped of her clothing, which I could see. Right. Yes. Then shot in the back of the head with a 12-gauge double-barrel shotgun. Okay. Mm, and the thing said, like the article says, that there were some 300 shotgun pellets at the scene. And some were what? even contained in, like, her skull. But then I remember Was it like a buckshot? But then I remembered that the person who found her was hunting. Mm. And like he was going to this area because I guess it's an area known for like you could do like turkey hunting or whatever. Because I'm thinking 300 like. Right. That's a lot. Right. And if that many had hit her, she wouldn't. There would be nothing of her left. Right. They found. I mean, at this point, too, it's been three years. They found most of her bones. Mm hmm. But in my head, I'm like, well, of course she had that in her skull. Because if that's where her body's been this whole time and people don't see it and they're shooting at things. Yeah, it's going to land It's going to land there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They also found, like, a piece of the shotgun that was supposedly from the killer's weapon. And I'm like, what the fuck performed this autopsy? Yeah. Indiana doesn't have anything good going on. No. <laughs> Wasn't our last one Indiana Injustices? <laughs> Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it was. So, no charges. Again, don't know how they come to this next guy. But in April of 2006, police arrested and charged John Myers II with the murder of Jill Berman. Who's he? Okay. A guy in town. uh, He doesn't have a good reputation. And, like, some articles said that this is who police thought it was. But I was like, I thought they thought it was the Klaus guy. Yeah. Because they thought it was him from the jump. Yeah. Then another article was saying that, like, um, investigators had given their, like, information to be passed up to, like, the head honchos in charge. And it wasn't getting passed up. So they would anonymously call the tip line. Everything got very messy at this point. Sounds like it. Like, totally just... Off the rails. Yeah. It's like someone dropped all the papers and put them back together, (laughs) and it wasn't in order. Yeah. Let me just straighten these out. Right. And then Alicia Evans, our friend from before, she was also indicted, but she was indicted on perjury charges because she's Meyer's cousin by marriage. Oh. And so I guess it counts that, you know, she lied under oath saying she didn't know anyone. Oh. Anything associated with her murder. And if this guy... Interesting. It seemed like a fucking long that, shot. Yeah. Didn't make any sense. That's a stretch. Don't find out more about it, so. <laughs> Great. Apparently there was some, like, anonymous tip from a caller who claimed to see a red car hit Jill, so fuck the truck. Yeah, the dark truck. Yeah, it's gone. We now have a red car. Okay. I don't know. So there's a, um, instead of, like, Wikipedia, it's Bloomingpedia. Oh. So it's, like, specifically for really Blooming. Good. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. So I don't know who wrote it because the author isn't obviously like on that page, but a lot of this information I get from that. So whoever wrote that, that's who you can give credit to. Okay. So here was the original theory. Okay. Berman had rode her bike south of town that day. There was apparently a discovery of a white water bottle that had been identical to the one that she carried on the frame of her bike. And Eyewitnesses had seen her in that area. Okay. In particular, a former classmate spotted her riding on Harrell Road near the area where the water bottle was found. Okay. Berman's bike was discovered within a mile of Myers' residence in a hayfield owned by a local farmer, Joe Pettin. So now this new theory is that she actually rode her bike north of town. Myers has spotted her from the interior of his home and in a fit of rage over... The breakup of his relationship with another woman. 
<laughs> left his home and abducted Berman and then murdered her. Okay. He's not a good dude because apparently this, like, previous girlfriend, she's only, like, 18 and he doesn't look that young. I, oh. I couldn't figure out how old he was, but it didn't look young. Uh-huh. And apparently he had, like, essentially kept her hostage or, like, trapped the girlfriend or Berman the girlfriend trapped in like his house for the weekend and she finally got out and like got like a restraining order against him jeez he had like a couple of restraining orders out against him and he had just gone to prison for something else when they had found her body Mm. so he had like struck a deal for whatever that other charge was Mm -hmm. and was currently serving that when they found the body okay Again, I have no idea what happened from 2003 to 2006 mm-hmm. to make them think it was this guy. Yeah, it's I like I would like a little bit anywhere. of information for why this man's arrested and not the three people who said, oh, yeah, we did it. Right. Even like, if they were canted, but still. Right. Like the newspaper articles I was looking at, like, didn't go into that. And I was not going to read the appeal case. No. God, those <laughs> things are long. They have their reasons, mm-hmm. but they're all stupid. <laughs> so. Although the dogs that were used in oh, yeah. to search at the time of her disappearance could not pick up any sort of scent detected north of where the bike had been dumped across the hayfield gate on North Maple Grove Road. The prosecution said that although there were no evidence that Myers spotted Berman near the intersection of Lost Man's Lane and North Maple Grove Road, which is the intersection south of the hayfield gate, which is like where he is, I guess. Okay. No other evidence is offered as to how Myers forced Berman into his red Honda CRX and loaded her bike into the small car. So she goes from being hit by, hit by a car. Right. And then now she's kidnapped and shoved into a car. And, like, I'm pretty sure a Honda CRX is, like, really small. So he had to have her and her bike. Right. And she's, like, a professional cyclist. That's just not small. No. It is light, though. It is light. So no claim had been made that Myers took her to his trailer, which was located 0.9 miles northwest of the Hayfield Gate on West Maple Grove Road near some sewage plant. He even offered to take a polygraph exam, but the offer was refused. Hmm. And I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense. No, especially if you gave it to the others. It gets worse. Of course it does. So due to the extensive media coverage of the case, Meyer's attorney asked the trial to be moved to uh, the southern end of the state. Mm -hmm. Request denied. It was held in Morgan Morgan County. The county right. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can't have an impartial jury. Nope. There was a lot of other things controversial about this case or trial, I mean. So apparently other controversial points concerning the trial were that evidence technician Jason Fajit was called to testify as a witness for the defense about evidence found in Berman's room bedroom, but he was unable to answer any questions as he was not present when Berman's room was searched. The evidence technician who collected the evidence had moved to another state. Patrick Baker, the attorney representing Myers, opted to present very little in the way of a defense, stating that the state had not proven its case, which is true. Mm-hmm. But he didn't really do anything to say this is why. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Apparently, and I only found this in one place, Mm -hmm. but supposedly, like, the jury conduct during this trial was, like, not peachy. What do you mean? Apparently, they were allowed to drink alcoholic (gasps) beverages. What? They had access to cell phones and televisions and conducted themselves in a manner described by one juror as, quote, fraternity party-like atmosphere. Yeah, that doesn't sound good. Despite lack of evidence, the jury returned with a guilty verdict in less than one hour. That's suspicious. Crazy. So obviously Myers goes to appeal his case. Oh, and he's like sentenced to 65 years in jail. Wow. So he goes to appeal on the grounds of suppressed evidence, inadequate counsel. And did he have any um, like relationship with her? I could not find anywhere. There was no There's connection. No connection. Like, yeah. how do they know each other? What it like it's truly like pull you out of thin air, and that's who it is. Right. It was truly this guy was pissed that him and his girlfriend broke up, mm-hmm. and just happened to see Jill at that exact moment, and decided, well, I'm gonna take out my anger over another situation that has nothing to do with this random stranger. Yeah, and just kill her. Okay. 
Good. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, he doesn't sound like a very great guy. Mm -hmm. But that seems like kind of far-fetched. That's really like escalation if you've never done anything near this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, I don't know. I feel like just like once they found her body and we're like, oh, she's been shot. And I'm like, has she though? Yeah. Like, I know it's hard to tell because it was mostly just bones, but like. You'd be able to tell. And I that, feel like a like a shotgun shot to the back of the head. Well, and that was there, but I'm like, how can you not take into account the fact that it was found in a place that hunters commonly go to? Yeah. Like that too. Especially if you're gonna find three hundred. Yeah. Can a gun even hold that many? No. Unless it's like what, a machine gun? Yeah. I even don't think then. So. I'm like I mean, a shotgun certainly doesn't hold three hundred. Right. It holds I'm, like two. two. Yeah. <laughs> so it goes to appeals case. Um, but he was denied by the Indiana Court of Appeals and the Indiana Supreme Court. So he tries again in 2015. And on October of 2019, U.S. District Judge James R. Sweeney of the Southern District of Indiana ruled that legal counsel for John Myers II was ineffective, saying, quote, The state of Indiana shall vacate all criminal pe- penalties stemming from Mr. Myers' murder conviction and release him from custody pursuant to that conviction unless the state of Indiana elects to retry Mr. Myers within 120 days. So apparently the ruling also said that his counsel, quote, failed to object. I don't know what that means. Two significant categories of evidence that seriously compromised his defense and effectively tainted his 2006 trial. So he was released? Okay. Patrick Baker, head of the legal team, he made a comment to the press saying, quote, Our legal team initially took on Mr. Myers' murder case in April of 2000, 2006 pro bono because we believed in his innocence, as we still do. We fight for the constitutional rights of our clients and, when necessary, take on difficult and unpopular causes in the interest of justice. We are very pleased the court's order has given John Myers and his family renewed hope. We expressed our heartfelt sympathies to the Berman family and will continue to pray for all involved. My thinking is, is they didn't feel like they needed to come with a bunch of stuff because the state didn't actually have a good case. Mm -hmm. Like, it it was painfully circumstantial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Common sense wise, they would probably think, well, of course, no one's going to believe that. Right. Yeah. But apparently, you know, inadequate. Morgan County Prosecutor Steve Soniga released a statement saying, we have received notice of the Federal Court of Appeals decision granting the defendants writ of habeas corpus. I feel like I'm uh, legally blonde right now. Yeah, legally blonding it up. Mm hmm. I have been in contact with the victim's parents, Eric and Marilyn Berman, as well as the lead investigator, Detective, I'm assuming RIT means they're not retired. That would make sense. Okay. Rick Lang. Needless to say, we are all disappointed with this outcome as we believed that 13 year, after 13 years, the jury's guilty verdict was final. I have spoken with the Indiana Attorney General's office and they are just analyzing the opinion and its ramifications. Thus, it is premature premature to discuss next steps in this case. However, I do plan on meeting with the victims and the investigator before any decision is made. Okay. So in November of 2019, the Indiana's attorney general did appeal the federal judge's decision to release Myers from prison. Oh. So he was supposed to get out in June of 2020. Okay. But I guess, like, the appeal... That hearing happened in May. Oh, so like right before he was supposed to. Mm -hmm. And concluded in August of 2020. So after he was supposed to get out. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the court reversed the decision and Meyer's conviction in Jill's death was upheld. Damn. The three panel judge said the district court was right about his representation, but the jury's verdict was was the proper outcome based on the state's case against Meyer's. That sounds kind of weak. He tried to bring his case to the U.S. Supreme Court, but they denied to review it in 2021. So he's still the only one charged and convicted for the murder of Jill Berman. So a little bit about Jill. And on a positive note. So like I said, she had just completed her freshman year at Indiana University. She had lived in Teeter Quadrangle and worked at the Student Recreation Sports Center, McDonald's at Reed Hall, IU Athletic Outfitters, and Hosiers for Higher Education during her year at IU. Wow. She had graduated from honor with honors from Bloomington High School South 
in June 1999. This is all from her find a grave, by the way. Mm -hmm. Earning an honors diploma. While in high school, Jill received the following awards. Bertha Rogers Hinkle Memorial Scholarship in 1999. Ross and Jean Marr Scholarship. First United Methodist Church, 1999. President's Academic Fitness Award in 1999. All-Conference Indiana Scholar Athlete Award. Leadership Opportunities Through Service or LOTS Certificate. National Honor Society. Varsity Letters for Volleyball at Bloomington High School in 96, 97, and 98. All-Conference Indiana Award for Volleyball in 97. Honorary Captain Award for Volleyball in 97 as well. Jeez. She was a member of the First United Methodist Church, the FUMC, F-U-M-C Youth Fellowship, Disciples in Indiana, the Monroe County YMCA, and the BHSS Volleyball Team. In 98 to 99, Jill served as lots is a lot senior at Bradford Woods, which which is with um, apparently two elementary schools. Mm -hmm. She participated in an exchange program with students from Germany and her high school. She participated in track and field and swimming at her high school. From 95 to 99, she was a member of various volleyball clubs, including Renegade Circle City South Central Indiana Volleyball Association the Ho and Hosier Heartland. She was formerly a member of the Indiana Track Club Girls, Inc., where she played softball, basketball, Boys and Girls Club of Bl Bloomington, where she played soccer, Girl Scouts, and Brownies of Tulip Trace Council and Monroe County 4-H. Not to. While in high school, she worked at Mr. D's, Luca, Pizza, and Dairy Queen in Bloomington. She had planned to work on staff at Camp Brosis, the IU Alumni Association Family Camp in Wisconsin during the summer of 2000. Jill had served as a volunteer at Bloomington Hospital as a candy striper, community kitchen, and Hosier Hill Food Bank. She also participated in several FUMC mission trips, crop walk, and twice served as a page in the Indiana State Legislature. So her hobbies included cycling, a road bike, mm -hmm. volleyball, traveling, hiking, and camping, particularly in the Rocky Mountains, skiing, both snow and water. Oh. Swimming, exercising, weightlifting, reading, listening to music, spending time with friends. Although, how did she have time? I know. And having fun. Jill's ambition was, quote, to meet any new people, establish strong friendships and relationships, become involved on campus, in the community, and to grow as a person. She planned to, quote, this is a quote literally from her, mm -hmm. to find success in the classroom throughout my college career, to be the best I can be in my chosen field of study. So, she also has what's called the Jill House that was built, and it is a home for cancer patients undergoing treatment in the Midwest Proton Radiotherapy Institute in Indiana, which opened in 2008. And then there's also Jill Berman Run for the End Zone, a 5K walk run that was started in October of 2000 and has continued since. Wow. So that is the strange story. Of Jill Berman. She did a lot. She did at a lot. At such a young age. And all that, like, especially all the things she did on campus within just the first year she was there. Yeah. That's crazy. I definitely feel like I'm in the same theory as you, where I don't think it's the one guy. I definitely think it was the group of three. Yeah. Their story just seems too suspicious and too many things fit. Like, oh, we wrapped her right. up in plastic, we stabbed her, and then right. they found plastic and a knife and bungee right. cords. Right. Yeah. I get that the the whole thing with the body not being where any of that other stuff was found. Like, I don't even think it was close. But does the water connect to where she was found? That I don't know. Because if it does, then that makes sense. Right. I have no idea. Mm. Like, and truly, I mean, there's animals, too. Right. Exactly. My thing was, I was like, well, if they found most of her. Right. Then, I don't know. I, honestly, I feel like the first story made the most sense, mm -hmm. given the fact that people had been coming forward for years saying that yeah. these three were saying that they had done it. Mm -hmm. And what's wild is there will be some cases where it'll be like one person says something and that's what they base their entire case off of. They're right. like, this one witness said it, so it has to be true. Right. But then for this one, they had, what, 22 witnesses saying something? And they're like... Like the thing they had actual evidence for, no one was ever convicted. The guy was convicted on some other charge that was unrelated. The other two, well, obviously the Ashley girl for perjury, but uh -huh. Wendy, nothing. No charges of any kind. And I think that with this guy, however they got to him, uh -huh. I still don't understand. I do know that, like, he had, he did make some quotes to, like, he did say some things to, like, his grandmother about saying he had done something bad. But it was very, like, vague. Mm -hmm. It's not like he outright said, this is what I did. Yeah. 
And I guess he had also made some comment like, oh, I bet her body are going to be her body's going to be found in the woods somewhere. And it was found in the woods. Yeah. And I'm like, OK, but that's like everything they had was based on literal hearsay mm-hmm. versus the other one. It started off as hearsay, but then they found all this other shit. Right. They were able to find ways to corroborate it. There you go. <laughs> I think when things started to fall apart when she recanted, which is why I really think it happened before the body was found. Mm-hmm. And then it was like, oh, well, the body wasn't even found anywhere near where she said it was. So obviously her story is not true. Right. That kind of got that ball rolling was like, well, no, they have nothing to do with it. Obviously, it's, you know, whatever. And then I feel like desperately they needed to have somebody because this Mm -hmm. was getting national attention. Yeah. And they just went with this guy who not a pillar of the community by any means, Mm -hmm. but so could fit it. Yeah, I guess. In a way. Yeah. I mean, there was so little talked about like cause of death. And, like, what may have happened. Mm, yeah. It was just, like, all of a sudden, this guy did it. Yeah. And I was, like, was, is it just because he lived nearby? Like, I don't. Right. He happened to have a red car that one person said they saw. <laughs> yeah. I it feels know. like they were just trying to grasp at straws to kind of make it so that he was it. The really sad part, remember that girl I told you about that also had gone missing? Mm-hmm. So the article right next to that one where it was, like, yeah, it's officially been identified as Jill. The one right next to it was, like. This other family who had had this missing daughter around the same time, same age, were waiting to see if maybe those bones might have been their child, and it wasn't. That's so sad. Yeah. I don't know um, what happened with that one. Mm. It's Saul, technically. Technically. Just doesn't But it doesn't feel like a satisfying It doesn't sound like it's been solved correctly. No. Good point. That's a good way to word it. Yeah. Well, thanks for listening through two very weird cases. Yeah, these were weird. Yeah. Again, with like the the evidence here. Yeah. So I don't know. But I will put her house and the 5K, like I'll put links to that in the show notes. Okay. In case there's a way you can participate or donate or whatever, and whether you're in the area or not, just so you have information about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for listening. Nicely done on this one. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Yeah. Follow us on all things social media. Mm-hmm. Send us an email at a scary state podcast at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. Anything else you got to add? Stay scary. Stay safe.